We are ready to start. Yay! Amazing. So, everyone, refactoring of the hook. It's actually refactoring of the hooks, because we're using hooks today. Um, oh, wait, I have my thing. So you might have heard of React. As I mentioned before, while well, there was no running. Uh, if you're not familiar with React, probably this is not the right talk for you, because I give a lot of things for granted. But I still want to talk about components. Uh, this is, comes from the React doc, so components are declarative. Uh, sorry, no, React itself is declarative, component-based, and is something that is meant to be learned once and rewrote everywhere. And we've seen that happen. We have React Native, we have React for Web, and I think there is also React for Windows right now. Um, but yeah, so that's the concept. What we're going to focus today on is the component-based part. So, uh, as you might know, components as two ways of kind of refreshing themselves. Um, and there are two things that are uh, related to this uh, re-trigger of uh, the re rendering. One is the props. So if props changes, the component would uh, re-render. Uh, and the props comes from outside. So there is something that I component that would inject props to your component. And, updates. and then there might be uh, an internal state which is held by the component itself. And if it changes, that would trigger another re-render. We're all familiar with that, right? Okay. So um, we have two ways of writing components in React nowadays. Uh, one is a function. Uh, sometimes it gets called functional component. That's not really true. Uh, but um, let's say simple function component. And everyone, I guess, in the room either or wrote code like this. Um, so it's a function that takes the props and renders them uh, along with some markup. Um, and then there is a class component. The difference with the class component is that you can, well, I haven't shown them here, but you can add uh, lifecycle hooks, well, sorry, not hooks, wrong word, lifecycle methods like component did mount or uh, component will unmount and things like that, as well as maintaining an internal state and use it, as we said, to render. The thing is, Neither of these models really captures what React is. And that's not me saying it. That's Dan Abramov. Um, so Dan uh, tweeted, uh, why are these models insufficient to describe React? And he gives an answer as well. Uh, pure function model doesn't describe local state, which is an essential React feature. And we saw that right? with the function component, you can't really uh, add the state in it. Um, on the other hand, the class model doesn't display the purish rendery, rendering. Uh, these are what these I don't can't pronounce that inheritance and the lack of direct initialization and receiving props because normally a class doesn't really receive render on that. So it's, it's kind of a skewed thing. And today we are going to look at how the um, React team fixed this. My name is Marco. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as ChadMax. Uh, my website is chadmax.com, and this is bluntly copied from uh, a business card I found online. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and on the corners of this slide, you can find the most common emojis that are in my Git commits. I work for Condé Nast and especially for Vogue, um, as you can see. And I'm happy to introduce you to my pet projects about colors. So everything started, the background story, everything started when I um, looked at this uh, talk from Lynn Fisher. She was talking about R, the web, and tiny UX. I really recommend this talk. Uh, if you find a video or even the slides on slide deck, that's an amazing talk. Uh, you might have heard of her because of a single div, a website uh, she made where you style a div and create the more weird things just with CSS and what if. It's pretty cool. Have a look at it. She created a lot of pet projects. The talks goes through a lot of uh, air creation. And uh, there was one that really got me. Uh, this is R-Codes. Uh, the website is rcode.es. Um, and this is a list of um, airport codes uh, that uh, 
she started collecting, put together, created a website, and people started adding their own. And so yeah, the, the, she has this beautiful uh, kind of encyclopedia of uh, artboard codes. And since I'm going toward my middle age crisis, I thought, I want a list, I want an encyclopedia completed sort of thing. And so I looked at uh, Wikipedia, at a page that is called the list of lists. And I found that there is a list of colors. Uh, I don't think it's by any means complete. Uh, I think it's based on the crayon colors or something like that. But the cool thing was that uh, I had names, I had acts of the colors, and I could have a list. And this encyclopedically complete, considering it's on Wikipedia. Already, so. And so I built a website. Uh, again, this website is not particularly nice in terms of UI, but they had a lot of fun doing it. And the best part was actually scraping the website, like Wikipedia, and collecting the data, and then figuring out what to do with it. Um, I have sort by at the top, I have filter, and there is the CSS name when available, like Alice Blue and things like that. Um, I think it's, it was rewarding, if not nice. Um, the, I don't want to go too deep into the code, of everything of it, but the initial component, the Good app morning. component, holds the state for filtering lists and etc. So you can see at the top that I have uh, a color list that comes from the original list. It doesn't matter how it's fetched, it's actually imported as a JSON. Uh, there is a color filter, which is um, the text search content, like the actual string that the user would search. Um, a sort by, could be three values, I think, is name, X, or. Good uh, morning. What, what was that now? <laughs> okay. Where was I? Oh yeah, and the style. So, <laughs> a bit weird. And the style. And the style itself is um, something that they use in the theme for emotion. And Good morning. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna pretend that you didn't hear that. Good morning. Maybe it was my laptop? Good morning. No. Uh, I don't know what machine is talking right now, but, <laughs> but it, <laughs> it is frightening a bit. It's definitely not me. Hopefully. Anyway. That would have been, that would have been an Good amazing. Good morning. Uh, oh, um, okay, that would have been an amazing joke if I made it. <laughs> I'm not that smart, though. Anyway. I have a sort by function <laughs> that sets the uh, current sort by as a string and sets and filters the color, and sorts the color with a, a helper called sorter that would take the color, analyze the X, and do things. It doesn't matter. Like it's on GitHub. If you want, at the end, I give you the link. But um, I have a filter that would filter the color by name. And again, this is an external function, and but I want to simplify as much as I could. Uh, and set the colors and the current filter. And I have an uh, on color change that would change the style of the app. Basically, uh, if you click a color, the background of the page becomes the background, and the color of the text uh, is the most readable. Uh, between black and white at the currently, but yeah, based on the background. And then there is the app UI, which it doesn't quite matter at this point. Um, so it's a rather biggish component to do something as simple as I have on the page. And I know that my friend, the peer programmer, would say something on the lines, you can't refactor this. Nobody likes you, peer programmer, please go. It didn't go. <laughs> Maybe it was. A the peer program. Anyway, so let's try to uh, code our way with hooks uh, to refactor this up. Bear with me. If, someone's, if a machine speaks while I'm coding, I will completely freak out. <laughs> OK. And again, I appreciate I haven't given you anything about hooks yet. Uh, so we're going to learn by doing. I'm going to start doing things with components, 
mention thing while I'm doing them, and then go back and see what I did, hopefully. I have a cheating folder in case I completely fluke this. So first of all, I'm going to comment out the class, because um, uh, hooks can be used only in functional, uh, sorry, in function components. So I'm going to export at the default uh, function. And this default function would return exactly the same uh, as my render, right? So I'm going to take this. And I'm going to bring it up to my default. Okay. Of course, now I have a few things that are not defined, and that's what we need to work uh, on. So first things first. Uh, so we are using the state, so I'm going to import use state. There we go. And what I want is to look at the shape of the state that I had before so that I can replicate what it was in with the use state. So let's go here. Let's get this. And then I can start with the colors. So I can set const colors set colors equals use state and original oh, original list. So here it is the uh, use state. It returns uh, an array. The first argument of the array is um, the state, and the second is a way to modify that state. Um, use state takes um, a default state as the argument. So it's rather, I would say it's rather straightforward, but let's do all of it, and then we can talk about the rest. So I'm going to have the, um, two, two, two. Uh, the current filter is an empty string by default. So I have the current filter and set current filter. And same would be for the uh, current sort by, except the current sort by as name as a default. By a current sort by. Everyone with me so far? Yeah. Cool. Um, so again, current sort by, current filter. So I, I don't have a this anymore here. So I'm going to get these away so I can see that they are marked as undefined as well. So next step is I need the uh, functions to make those. Oh, sorry, the style. Yeah, sure. Um, so the style is a little more uh, is a little more. The default is an object. Okay, and this is the style. Style. Okay, I think I have everything right now. You can you can interrupt me and correct me whenever you want. Please do. Um, let's let's do a pair programming session together. Um, okay, so I have everything defined in uh, in the state. Well, well, everything that was in the state is now defined with use state. Oh, really? Do I? Uh, sort by is current sort by. Yeah, okay. No. No, these are the functions. Yeah, these are the functions. I just misnamed them in the original one. Um, but that's what we are looking at right now. Right? So I need these three callbacks, basically, to be um, defined and to actually change the state instead of using set state. So I'm going to take this, um, and I'm going to delete the rest because it's pointless at this, at this stage. So what I need to do is define uh, current sort by, current filter, and on color change. So let's start with that. Uh, constant color change takes an X and does this. So again, at this point, I don't need to set the state anymore. I can call the function set style straight away with the new style. Right? Uh, sort by is the same. I can do const sort by takes the sort by. Instead of setting this thing, it would set current 
sort by with sort by and uh, set colors with the sorter. So in this case, I don't need to execute the sorter here because by default, if you pass a function to a um, setter, it would execute that, that function passing in the, the state that is at the moment. So I, I don't need to pass in the state again as I did before. So that's it. And then the filter, similar thing. Uh, set colors. Colors, set current filter, current filter. That should actually be it. Right? Did I miss anything? Are you good with it? OK, there is one thing I want to do more than what I did, which is use, use callback. And the reason for this is that the, um, these functions are defined uh, at every render. And so they would be, uh, for the children component, different functions. And that would trigger a re-render um, re of the children components, even if there isn't any change in the actual um, props that are passed. So if I use a use callback, uh, those would be memoized, which means they would return the same instance of the function, and that would not re-trigger a render uh, in the children component. Uh, it's a nice thing. It doesn't. It, it depends by the complexity of your app and how deep is the tree of, depend of components. But since we're talking about docs, that's worth mentioning. So if I didn't break anything, at this point, my website should work. And should work pretty much in the same way you used, please don't break, in the same way you used it was before, oh, did something, set state, there you go. Uh, set state, this is set, no wait, set style. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Right. Good catch. Nice, it works. Okay. <laughs> Woo. Yay. So I'm done with the live coding. That was it for me. Let's go back to the slides. Two, two, two. Take that, peer programming. Um, OK. So we've, we've been looking at a few hooks. Um, I want to talk about, of course. Uh, let's talk about hooks in general first. So hooks are opt-in. They're not mandatory. They, they're not needed for your app. Uh, they are 100% backward compatible. You can use your hooks in certain components and not in others. That's totally fine. And they are available since the release of 16.8. Um, uh, we looked at a few hooks. I really, OK, now it works again. Uh, so the use state is the one that is probably the most uh, simple to get access to. Um, OK. Uh, and as we saw before, it returns an array. Uh, the first value of the array is the value of the state at that point, and the second value of the array is the function to modify that state, and it takes a default value. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the setter can take a function, and that function will be executed taking the value of the state at that point in time. The, thing, the, the other thing is that even the use state itself could take a function if you have some complex operation that needs to be run. Uh, it doesn't have to be an object itself or, or a string or whatever. Um, so yeah, again, these two things are exactly the same thing. Um, and you can run a few set states in a row because that they get enqueued so that it wouldn't trigger several render uh, it would be uh, just one at the end of it. The other one we saw is use callback. And the, as I mentioned, use callback uh, wraps the function and returns a memoized version of it. So it would be the same function, exactly the same function, not a new variable uh, that gets defined every single time. And so it wouldn't trigger a re-rendering. If you do use a, a React memo or uh, a pure component in your children components. So we're going to move forward to user reducer. So the component that we just built uh, is still quite long. Like, it didn't change much in terms of size, right? It's, it's still quite uh, convoluted if you look at it. 
like if you read through, like it's, there is still quite some functions, definition, and blah, blah, blah. So there, there is some ad wrapping to, to be done here. Um, if you are familiar with uh, Redux, is anyone that is familiar with Redux in the room? OK, a few of you. Uh, you might have seen the pattern of using reduce. Well, you've surely seen them. Uh, a reducer function is a function that would take uh, kind of a pub sub style payload. So there is a type of action that happens and a value that comes with it, a payload that comes with it. Um, so you, the, the reducers look like the function itself looks pretty much as you state. The only difference is that it takes two parameters. One is the reducer, and the other one is the default state. So uh, a reducer is something like this. So you get um, the state, and you get the type and the payload as the second argument. And based on the type, you can apply different transformation to the state of the app. It's a centralized, page where, uh, centralized place where to manage the state of an app, basically, rather than having every single component to deal with that. Uh, so you can isolate all those functions that change your state, you can test them in isolation, you can make sure that they work uh, without having to fire up the component, etc. And on the bright side, you can simplify quite a lot the code of the component itself, because um, you can emit uh, dispatch uh, actions that have a type and a payload. And I want to focus on this abstraction that I added on top, which is um, an emit that simplifies every single what I return in every single uh, callback. Uh, but yeah, the, it, it, you have a type, you have a payload, and that would trigger a different change in state in the reducer, in the same way Redux would deal with that. And again, this, these four lines do exactly what they did. That's because we abstracted all the state transformation in the reducer, right? So the component looks much, much neater at this point. This is it. There isn't anything else, because all the logic went away, basically. Does it make sense? All good? I'm going to try this again. <laughs> no, it works again. Technology. Use effect is, uh, if I remember right, the last one we're going to look at today. Uh, use effect is really powerful and is um, a hook that accepts a function that contains imperative and possibly effect of full code. Um, this comes from the React docs as well. And Think of effect as an escape hatch from the Re React purely functional world into the imperative world. OK, this, to me, is very difficult to appreciate. I don't know what it means, OK? Um, and that's because I'm not a real programmer. I come from a communication studies. I've done front-end all my life. But the, the, all these computer science terms are a little lost to me. But if you think about what you can do with um, the use effect, then everything is more clear. Uh, so you can add data fetching and have a network side effect. Or you can deal with the DOM or the window. You can update the title of the page. You can subscribe to uh, the window size. You can write things to local storage or read things from local storage. Anything that is not within the context of your React app can be done in a use effect. Um, and this, this is pretty nice. I, I've see, like, I wrote myself a lot of code that was super weird to do these things. And now I have a, a way of getting them in a in the right way into my app. So for example, uh, this is an example of fetch, fetching data uh, within a use effect. Um, in this case, we have, um, well, th th there is a first gotcha that, that got me. So you can't return a, syn a synchronous function straight away as a use effect. So you need to define a function uh, within uh, that is asynchronous. Um, we'll get to that. Um, but we have a list of dependencies as a synchronous is an array. Every single time that prop that ID changes, this function gets re-triggered, um, which means that your data fetching is always in sync with the props that you get from outside. Right? Like, it does make sense. There is a direct relation between the execution of this function and what prop you need to be used in the fetch. Um, this thing is actually quite controversial, because a few people use it to replicate the um, component it mount uh, approach. So if you do this, if you have no dependency, or better, if you declare an empty array which has no dependency in it, this thing gets launched only one time. There is no change happening, right? And in the same way, given that effect allows you to return a function to clear the effect you made, 
if you do this, this is a component will amount because it runs only once, and it returns. It just returns a function that does something when it gets a mount. Uh, and that's the reason, by the way, why you can't do an async function in use effects, because an async function returns a promise, while use effects expects a function to clear the state. It can't handle a promise as a return. But that's, again, that's a little advanced. I think if we stick with the, with the idea that this is not great as an approach, replicating component it mount, and that's because you need to kind of switch your mind. So the question is not when this effect runs, but is this effect synchronized with. So if we look at it again, so this thing happens at the every state change. So you, you declare no dependency means it doesn't matter. Every time there is a reflow, this would think, sync with, because there is no state change, all the state changes would trigger it. This syncs with no state changes. And that's why it gets executed once, because it doesn't matter what state changes you have. There is is not sync with any. And this one is synced with this specific state change. Are you with me? Cool. So let's try to take this uh, use effect and to make something valuable out of it. So I'm a bit of a web nerd, and I think that the URL is the first order in an app, or it should be, anyway. So I want, if I apply a filter, that filter to be reflected in the URL. So if I refresh the page, I can see that filter applied. Right? Some SPAs are not great at that, but I think it's it should be done. We're living on web URLs are speaking to us. Um, so I'm going to use, use effect, and I'm going to define, and again, no live coding here because it's complex. I'd rather talk. Uh, I'm going to define the dependency that I want to see in the URL. So those two things are the things that I want to be reflected in the URL. right? So I want the current store by and the current filter to be values that I store in the URL. Then. I have to make a check on whether it's the first time this thing is triggered or if it is not. Because the first time I need, I need to read from the URL and recover the state that is already. And they use state for that. At the top, you see I can use state false, which means there is a semaphore approach, right? That state false, and then I set it to true. Um, and then I use this helper, which is listened to history. Uh, this behind the hood uses a, a window on pop state or something like that. And I would read from the URL in my callback those two values. I would check if they are defined in the URL, and they, I would use the, um, the function to set, um, to, to, to trigger the change, right? So with me? Cool. Last step. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the, the helper. I, I parse what I get in the search, I add an even listener, and I call the even listener immediately just to make sure that it doesn't trigger only on pop state, which is when you use the back and forward buttons in the browser, but even immediately when I loaded the page the first time. It's a little simplified, but that's the core concept of it. Um, and again, in the callback, I use that data, and I, I call the function. I don't need any more to do this thing. This is true. And that's it. And the state doesn't change anymore. Right? So I restore my state from the URL. Next time there is a change on current sort by or current filter, and at this point it will be by a user interaction, what I want to do is to transform from my object to history. So I want to update the URL. And that is another helper that does something on the lines of this. So it would take my, uh, the data I pass in, and it would stringify it and add to the query string. Okay. And with this, I should be able to have that change. But let's see it working. As I promised, I'm not live coding anymore, but uh, I also mentioned that I have a few cheating things in here. So I have my cheating up function with history. So the up function is history as exactly what we saw before. So I'm going to take my index and I'm going to import 
up function with this tree. There we go. So if this works as I expect, if I do this, there you go. Current sort you. If I refresh the page, it should show me the list. Yeah. So I haven't optimized it, so you should see a flash of unordered things, but then it recovers the state and it does it as I expect, right? And now I have the URL that is the ultimate uh, holder of the of the there you go. Nice. It works. But then this is very specific to my app, right? I have a thing that works with those properties and works with this thing. I think uh, we can do something about it and make it a little more abstract. Um, I want something on these lines. I could have done, I could have wrote a different API for it, but I think this is good enough. Um, so I want it to be uh, with the values I want to pass in and with the setters that needs to be executed when uh, those values change. Uh, again, I could have done something like this, matching a little more the uh, use state and other things approach. I had wrote it already, and I didn't want to get back to changing the API. So bear with me. Sorry about that. But <laughs> it's up to you, though. It's a custom hook, so you can define your own API. So let's change this thing, and let's make it generic enough to be used in any app with any value, with any uh, setter. So first thing first. I want to bring it away from my component and set an export with a use query string. Second, I need to change the dependencies because right now the dependencies are uh, the values that are used in that specific component. Uh, and I don't want that. I want to use the values that are up there. Luckily enough, we have object values that would take it. And that would be an array of the values that comes in my values object. And that's amazing. And then I need to work on recover them, right, from the URL. So this listen to history data would be slightly changed to look like this. So you have the keys that comes with the value. And for each key, I would check whether the data is there. And if it is there, I would take the same key from the server and execute it with the value that comes with it. Are you with me? OK. Let's use prettier on this. Um, use the set restore, blah, blah, blah. And the last bit is the object to history. And again, rather straightforward values. I just pass them. Uh, it is with values. That's it. So again, this is the abstraction that we applied to make sure that we could use this with anything. Uh, we could use this to. Uh, any component, right? I, again, it should be just working, so let's try that as well. Um, instead of this, I'm going to use the import from app cheating up with history hook. The app with history hook is this use string current current filter and hook. Helpers, maybe? Yes. Hook. There you go. Same as that. If I save this. There you go. Same thing. Recover from the state. Sorry, from the URL. Change the state. Oof. I'm actually surprised myself. But let's go back to the presentation. Uh, and take advantage of what we mentioned before about the user fact capability to return a function uh, that cleans the state. Um, so instead of, uh, of storing the uh, Boolean as a, we've done this, sort of semaphore, uh, we could store the listener. So if we have an history listener uh, and a set history listener, we could then make the subscribe to history to return the callback that was assigned to the pop state. And store the history in the state, and I didn't store it as a value straight away because, as we mentioned before, the set history listener would ex execute the function with the current value of the state. So if I want to store a function, 
in the state, I need to have a function that returns that function, okay? Um, because again, it would be executed if not, and that bite me actually. And then I can return a function that cleans my association between the pop state and my callback, so that I have no kind of memory leftovers or anything like that. Right? So at this point is completely uh, abstract and cleans its own uh, association with things and events and blah blah blah. Not and the component in the end, like just to add that feature is this bit. It's quite neat overall, I think. Do you agree? Um, yeah, and that was it. Like it's not a huge amount of code in itself, and it's. It might be a little complex if you haven't seen anything like that before, but if you get used to it, it's like the concept themselves are not hard. Um, surely my friend Perpomer would say, you should probably test this. And, and they're actually right. They're actually right. So let's, let's see how we can test them. Ooh. Again, this is our custom look. And normally when I do test this thing, I would try to test the final effect uh, that they have because I don't want to end up testing my implementation of it. The thing is, with the URL, an abstract context with like Jest or something like that, uh, it could get a little tricky to test um, the changes on the URL. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to mock a few things out of this, uh, which are my helper. So the things I wrote that is tested, that's tested elsewhere, I can kind of rely on it. Um, it's not a super safe test is not an integration test, but it's good enough for my purposes for this specific thing. Um, so again, I'm using just, anyone familiar with just? Okay. Um, so I'm mocking those things. I'm returning uh, a listener function as a string because I only care uh, about the fact that it returns something. Um, and I'm mocking the state server. And then I'm creating a component that uses my hook. Um, and doesn't do anything else. And by doing that, I can write tests like this. I can mount my component. Uh, I can check that the subscribe to history has been called straight away, which is what I expect, that it checks, uh, that, it, that it does connect my subscribe to history to the pop state um, and execute it immediately to uh, get the state from the URL. And then I can check the callback that was returned to me from the uh, pop state and execute it with a different value and check that state setter is called with that value. Okay, this, this might be a little more complex, but does it make sense? Still, still with me? I, I'm testing that all the calls that I expect to be called with something happens, basically. And on top of that, I could check the further execution should invoke the object to history. So I set the prop to something else after the component has been mounted already and they check that subscribe to history is not called, and this time I check that the object to history is called. So I know that I'm not subscribing twice, but I'm actually getting the uh, object to history called. If I don't change the props, nothing, oh, sorry. If I don't change the props, nothing should happen. So I don't, I, I check that passing the same exact prop wouldn't trigger again any change. And then I expect that a mounting would trigger my clean function, cleaning function, right? I would unsubscribe that. So I kind of tested that my cycle makes sense. Again, it's not the best test. Probably there are other ways to test this. This was my way of showing how you could do it. There are many ways that are many helpers on NPM. Uh, there is a different way of testing this proposed by the um, React documentation. So there are ways to um, OK, I'm almost done. So yeah, I'm almost done. Before we jump. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't like questions on stage, so you can get me afterward. In the meantime, I have a, a few FAQs for you, so we can clear out a few things. So why should we use hooks again? Like, why changing? Um, I think the main reason is that they provide a better mental model of how a component works. Uh, it's a bit weird at the beginning. You expect functional things to be functional. Sorry, function component to be functional. You expect an input that gets always the same output. But not components. There are mathematical functions. Uh, it, a component is different. The mental 
a lot of components is slightly different, and hooks help to uh, create in your mind that model for a component. The other reason to do it is that by moving my class to a, um, a function with hooks, I saved half a kilobyte. And that was one class in an app. If you consider how many stateful components you might have in your apps, especially if they're big, I guess you can save quite a lot. And that's because bubble um, transform, transportation of classes is not very efficient. Classes are an hard model. Like they're not, they don't exist in um, previous ACMA scripts. So when you transpile them, it needs to sort out the same behaviors with different with function behind the hood, um, while a function gets minimized and transpiled in a way more efficient way. If you care about size, and you should, uh, it's a good way to have quick wins. Are hooks stable? Um, so the answer is yes and no. Uh, the basic ones, the one I showed you, probably yes. Uh, some others might evolve a bit. I haven't covered all of them, as I mentioned before. There are a few others out there. Uh, and there are a lot of community ones as well. I just want you to show a thread of tweets. Um, I, I don't expect you to read the whole thing. This is different people in the Rack team giving different answers <laughs> to questions on Twitter. And that, that was so probably they, they cleared out their, their mind in the meantime, but this was the last tweet of it. Um, they didn't have a broader agreement on how things would work in the future on certain things. Like the, this one specifically about the empty array at the end of use effects. Uh, at some point they said we might get to ignore it in, the, in newer releases. So they are stable, but get it with a pinch of salt, if it makes sense. Um, are there more hooks? Yeah, I answered already. Yes, there are a few more in React, built in in React. There are other custom ones, community driven. There is a lot of documentation out there. Um, so, yeah, have a look. Uh, and they'll give you a few resources at the end of this. Um, should they start using that now? Up to you. They're available. Uh, I don't use them in production at my company. I use them in every single pet project I have, and they have a few. I, I like them. Uh, again, it takes a some time to get used to it and to make sense of them. Uh, but I think they're valuable. Um, are classes disappearing as, a compo as components? No. Not in the foreseeable future. The, the React team was super clear about that. Um, hooks are an addition to what we have right now. It's not uh, by any means at the moment something that would replace anything. And so what's the most important takeaway of this talk, if anything? And so this is a tweet that yesterday blew my mind. So yesterday, Uno said that you can't stack force, plus force on plus force. Do you play Uno? Have you ever played Uno? OK, I don't know about you, but that was a classical thing. Like, if you had the plus four, like, hey, you get hate. That was it. Apparently, it's not allowed. And yeah, exactly. Everything we know is wrong. And that's my takeaway, I think. Like, we should always uh, reconsider our practices and what we do, because there might be a or um, new ways of doing things that you haven't considered. Yeah, this is, this is mind-blowing to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, take pictures, yeah, go with that. Um, so yeah, the most important takeaway is Always reconsider what you're doing right now, see if there are best ways. Uh, and not necessarily jumping on new things, it's fine if you take your time to embrace them, uh, but consider they are there. Learn that. Be attentive of what's out there and consider what's the best for your application or yourself. Um, development. Um, so yeah, this is the website uh, I've talked about. Colors uh, is on GitHub. There is a branch that is called uh, Refactory Talk, in which there are all the versions of things that I've done today. Um, these are some resources uh, about books. Uh, so the React.js official documentation, of course. Then uh, if you want blog, if you want insights, uh, is very good at uh, explaining complex things. So uh, I urge you to give a look at it. Um, hooks guide and usehooks.com. Uh, our uh, community-driven uh, selection of uh, hooks and code examples, and you can find a lot uh, to learn to use them. And yeah. <laughs>